Hello! In this video we're going to talk about non-opioid, otherwise known as non-narcotic, analgesics. These drugs are used to treat pain, and there's a couple of different families we'll talk about. Salicylates, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, acetaminophen, and at the end we'll talk about drugs used to treat gout. Increased anxiety or lack of sleep could make a patient's pain feel worse. So getting enough rest and having sympathetic people supporting them can raise their pain threshold. Pain control is of great importance as pain is often the issue that brings a patient into the office. Oddly enough, pain may, might be what keeps a patient from seeking care. A health care provider must be able to recognize and evaluate a patient's need for a medication. So here's an example of a tool that you can use to assess a patient's pain. So classifications of analgesics, right now we're talking about non-opioids, and they act primarily at the peripheral nerve endings, and they work by inhibiting prostaglandin synthesis. Um, that's debatable, not effective for severe pain. Uh, sometimes uh, non-opioid analgesics are exactly what a patient needs. And then later on we'll discuss opioid or narcotic analgesics in another chapter. So quick question. Pain relief by non-opioid analgesics is mediated via action. I'll let you read through those and pick what you think is the right answer. And the answer is B, at the peripheral nervous system. So let's talk about aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid. It is a cyclooxygenase inhibitor and it it, as we've said before, inhibits prostaglandin synthesis. And what does that mean? Okay, so prostaglandins basically sensitize your uh, self to pain. Um, it causes inflammation and fever, and it also causes um, permeability, which uh, causes vascular swelling. Aspirin is rapidly and almost completely absorbed from the stomach and the small intestine. It is widely distributed into most bodily tissues. Aspirin is known to displace a number of drugs from protein binding sites in the blood. Its half-life for a small dose is about two to three hours, but at higher doses the half-life can be as long as 15 to 30 hours, as at a higher dose aspirin has zero order kinetics, because at a higher dose only a constant amount can be metabolized per hour. Aspirin relieves mild to moderate pain such as arthritis, headache, or toothache. It can reduce a fever. It has anti-inflammatory effects because it stops prostaglandin synthesis. Aspirin irreversibly binds to platelets, which makes it effective for prevention of an MI or even in the treatment of an ischemic event. So if you suspect that somebody is having a heart attack, you can have them chew on one full strength tablet and then of course get to the emergency room as soon as possible. Large doses of aspirin have a uricosuric effect, which means it can increase the elimination of uric acid. And this is something that's too high in patients that have gout. So uses of aspirin, pain, fever, inflammation, and clotting. Aspirin's most frequent side effects are stomach upset, nausea, vomiting, even a gastric bleed. At usual therapeutic doses, aspirin irreversibly interferes with clotting by reducing the platelet stickiness. The time it takes to form a clot is prolonged, and each platelet is affected until a new platelet is formed, and that's about four to seven days. In children with either chickenpox or flu, aspirin is associated with Rye syndrome. Rice syndrome comes with liver and brain toxicity, and it could be fatal. So we don't usually recommend aspirin use in children. The incidence of a true al allergy to aspirin is less than 1%, but patients with asthma are more likely to be allergic. That could be 5 to 15%. So an overdose of aspirin can produce harmful effects and even death. A patient can have ringing in the ears, headache, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, dimness of vision, hyperthermia, meaning they're too hot, or an electrolyte imbalance can occur. Patients are, or children are actually the primary victims of an accidental poisoning. And education of parents regarding 
potential poisoning and proper storage and ch using childproof containers has reduced the accidental poisoning in children. Treatment of aspirin poisoning includes getting rid of the drug in the stomach by inducing vomiting or administering activating charcoal, and, and then other symptoms are treated symptomatically. The drug interactions between aspirin and warfarin can result in bleeding. Uh, warfarin, we've talked about a little bit, is an oral anticoagulant that is highly protein-bound to plasma proteins. If aspirin is given to a patient taking warfarin, it can bump the warfarin from that binding site that increases the anticoagulant effect. Remember, it's the unbound or free drug that has action. In addition, aspirin affects platelets and makes them less sticky. Bleeding and hemorrhaging may result from these interactions. Aspirin can lower the antihypertensive effect of many blood pressure medicines, including ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, thiazide, and loop diuretics. Aspirin has an effect on renal function, resulting in water and sodium retention, which could also raise blood pressure. So usual dose for aspirin, 325 milligrams to 650 milligrams every four hours for an adult. Um, more commonly used for prevention of MI is 81 milligrams of aspirin once daily. Aspirin can be combined with buffers, and that is said to reduce gastrointestinal effects. It can also be combined with oxycodone, which is a narcotic. Um, that product is called Percodan, and Ideally, you're using less narcotic and less aspirin and getting better effectiveness than either one alone. Uh, other examples of combinations is furanol, and that consists of aspirin, uh, butabotol, and caffeine. Sometimes it's with or without codeine. And again, you get more analgesia from the combinations than you would any of those products alone with hopefully fewer side effects. So quick question, the incidence of a true aspirin allergy is... C, less than 1%. So let's switch gears and talk about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. A lot of times we just say NSAIDs. NSAIDs are a large group that are used frequently over the counter and by prescription. Their mechanism of action and many of their pharmacologic effects and adverse reactions are similar to aspirin. They are analgesics, antipyretics, and anti-inflammatories. The kinetics, most of them peak within an hour or two hours. Um, food might reduce the rate of absorption, but we oftentimes will suggest that patients take them with food to reduce stomach upset. Um, they can also take them with antacids if they are already having stomach trouble. NSAIDs are metabolized in the liver and excreted in the kidneys. Gastric irritation, pain, bleeding problems can occur with all NSAIDs. Uh, they interfere with the normal protective mechanisms in the stomach, and this results um, in these GI symptoms. They can even cause an ulcer. The central nervous system side effects are dose-dependent, and they can include sedation, dizziness, confusion. NSAIDs interfere with clotting, but not as long as aspirin, um, and they are harmful in, to the kidneys in high doses. These agents are not addicting, Tolerance does not develop, and patients don't develop any kind of withdrawal symptoms if they stop taking them. NSAIDs, like aspirin, have been shown to reduce the effects of agents used for high blood pressure. They can also interact with lithium. Remember, sometimes patients take lithium for bipolar disorders. NSAIDs may increase the effect of digoxin. Digoxin is used for congestive heart failure. It's a drug that has a fairly narrow therapeutic window. And there are other drug-drug interactions with NSAIDs. So before patients are given an NSAID, we should check and make sure that we're not creating a problem for them. NSAIDs should be given cautiously to patients with asthma, cardiovascular or renal diseases, um, especially if they have fluid retention. Also patients with coagulation problems or peptic ulcers or ulcerative colitis. Um, we really need to think about if NSAIDs are an appropriate medicine. All NSAIDs can increase the risk of a serious cardiovascular clotting event, like uh, an MI or a stroke, and all NSAIDs may increase the risk of a serious GI event, including bleeding. 
So NSAIDs are useful in treating pain, uh, but it's always a good idea to use the lowest effective dose for the shortest period of time. Here are some common NSAIDs, and these are the ones that I want you to be able to recognize brand and generic name. Ibuprofen is known as Motrin or Advil. Naproxen is Naproxen. Aleve would be the over-the-counter name. Indomethacin is Indocin. Diclofenac is Voltaren. Itotalac is Lodine. Nambutone is Relafin. Meloxicam is Mobic. And Oxaprosin is Dapro. There's a lot more NSAIDs um, that are on the market. These aren't as commonly used, so I don't know that you should spend as much time memorizing these brand and generic names. So let's start with uh, talking about ibuprofen. It's the oldest member of the NSAID family, and we have the most clinical experience with this product. Usual dose, 200 to 800 milligrams every four to six hours as needed. Uh, generally, NSAIDs are not used in pregnancy, especially after uh, 30 weeks of gestation. Naproxen, known as naproxen or Aleve, um, these have a slightly longer half-life than ibuprofen, so these can be administered on an 8 to 12 hour schedule, which can be more convenient for a patient. The pharmacologic effects, the adverse reactions are all similar to, to ibuprofen. So quick question, which of the following statements is true? The answer is D, NSAIDs have caused renal failure. So let's talk about COX-2 inhibitors. NSAIDs action is on the COX-1 receptor, and it's the cause of many of their side effects, but not their therapeutic effects. So companies developed a more specific agents that target the, to the COX-2 receptor. COX-2 inhibitors work as well as NSAIDs, but they have fewer side effects. Celebrex is touted to be easier on the stomach. It's usually dosed 200 milligrams once or twice daily. Um, there's mixed evidence um, that links Celebrex or Celecoxib um, with an increased likelihood of a heart attack compared to placebo. But other drugs in that class, like Vioxx and Bextra, were pulled from the market because they were shown to cause an increased risk of a cardiovascular death. So quick question, NSAID stands for B, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So let's switch gears and talk about acetaminophen or generic Tylenol. Acetaminophen is used as an analgesic and an antipyretic in children and in adults. Its um, potency is about the same as aspirin and it's about equally efficacious. It is, however, not an anti-inflammatory, and it does not bind to platelets, platelets and doesn't cause bleeding. ...and completely absorbed from the GI tract. It gets to uh, peak plasma levels in about an hour, one to three hours. It's metabolized in the liver, and it's excreted in the kidneys, um, and its half-life is about one to four hours. With large doses, there's a metabolite that's thought to be hepatotoxic. Adverse reactions. Um, a single ingestion of 12 grams of acetaminophen is considered to be a toxic dose and can pose a high risk for liver damage. Alcoholics or patients who ingest three or more alcoholic beverages should avoid taking acetaminophen. Drug interactions. The cool thing about acetaminophen is it's remarkably free of drug interactions at usual doses. And again, it's used as an analgesic and an antipyretic. It's available in all sorts of products. Um, that's the difficulty sometimes is people don't recognize that acetaminophen can be given in lots of different ways. So quick question, which of the following choices has anti-inflammatory, antipyretic, analgesic, and antiplatelet action? The answer would be C, aspirin. Another question, which of the following choices is the best to use in pediatric patients for both its analgesic and antipyretic action? 
that would be B, acetaminophen. An acute overdose of acetaminophen may damage the B, liver. Let's have a brief discussion about gout. Gout um, usually occurs in men, and uh, it usually involves uh, pain in a joint. Oftentimes it's the big toe or knee. It's caused by an excessive level of uric acid, and it might be related to a person's diet, or it could just be they've got bad genetics. So we treat gout generally with colchicine, the new way of treating gout now is that we give them two 0.6 milligram tablets followed by one one hour later. We used to dose it more aggressively until the patient had diarrhea or bad side effects. And we're finding that that's just causing too much toxicity. Um, the acute attacks also are treated with NSAIDs, and a commonly used NSAID to treat gout is indomethacin. The brand name was Indocin. If um, a patient is put on a medicine to prevent a gout flare-up, they could be put on probenicid or allopurinol. So just as a background, things you can do to reduce your chances of getting gout. Um, exercise is, is obviously good for lots of things. E eating a healthy diet and keeping yourself well hydrated. Last quick question, which of the following agents is used to treat an acute attack of gout? And that would be indocin and colchicine. Thank you for listening and we'll see each other soon.